talk about exploring the role of activating transcription factor 6 in Kaposi's sarcoma associated herpes virus infection. <laughs> yes. <that's> yes. <laughs> Um, hi everyone, um, I am Adriana Ramirez de Brown, and that's my title, I'm not going to repeat it, <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, I am working in Dr. Killing Aparias' lab with my mentor Guillermo, um, and we are exploring that. <laughs> so, our overall main goal of the lab is to find ways to attack pirates of the human body. And who are these pirates? Viruses. So, just as a pirate takes control of a ship, a virus can take control of their a host cell. And these pirates of the human bodies have the capability to infect. And if you're squeamish, look away now. They, the, one, <laughs> the one I'm working with is known as KSHB, and this virus causes a can lead to cancer, known as Kaposi sarcoma, and as you can see, it causes skin lesions in patients that have a weak immune system, so mainly HIV patients. And that is why we want to study them in the lab, and our overall goal is to understand virus host interactions more, and to find targets for development of future therapies. So the specific goal I'm working with over the summer, or was, still am, is understanding the role of ATF6 in case tree infection. Now, that's very specific, so I'm going to start a little bit more broad. So as I mentioned before, viruses have the capability to take over a cell. And they do this by using host cell machinery. So they can take advantage of those that are already established in the cell. And one of the main things that these viruses hijack is the protein synthesis machinery of the cell. And one of these machines is known as the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, which is an organelle in the cell. And the ER, basically what it does, it processes and manufactures proteins. So you can think of your ER as a processing factory where it processes and manufactures products. And in this case, your products are the proteins. So imagine a scenario where you have a bunch of unprocessed products and they just are like accumulating and there's a bunch of chaos and stress you no longer have those functional products or proteins. But luckily, for the ER, this factory, you have a system in place that it's called the unfolded protein response, or UPR. Basically helps alleviate the stress in the cell, repackage those proteins, and get them functional again. The UPR is controlled by three main supervisors. PERC, IRE1, and the one I'm looking at is ATF6. These are all proteins, and they're basically the supervisors of the UPR. And where does the virus come into play in all this? You can think of the virus, KSHV specifically, is the corrupt supervisor that's basically whispering into ATF6 ear saying, hey, like everything's okay, when everything really is not okay. <laughs> so preliminary data has shown that if you block ATF6 function, you have an increase in the amount of viruses. And basically what this means is that the ER, instead of being a factory for cell proteins, is now becoming a factory for viral proteins. And that's not good. <laughs> but why? What's happening at this level, this specific interaction? This is unknown in the science realm, and that is my specific goal for the summer. So, and beyond. So my question that I'm answering was, how does KSHV modulate the ATF6 pathway to its advantage? Before I continue, I'm going to talk a little bit about KSHV and the cells that we will be using. So KSHV has two main cycles, the latent cycle and the lytic cycle. And the cells that we'll be using, the latent cycle, and the cells basically for us green. They literally shine green. And the latent cycle, what it is, is that the virus remains dormant in the cell. So there's no viral production, there's no like viral replication, it's just dormant in the cell. So the cell is fine. These cells have a gene known as replication transcription activator and transcription activator. And this gene, or TA, is basically the master switch. So when it's off, the cell is under the latent cycle of the virus. And when it's turned on with a drug known as doxycycline, you enter the lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle is basically the cycle where you just have a bunch of viruses being made, and um, in these specific cells, they fluoresce red. They actually look red. So back to my question. So that's a little about KSHB. I'm going to talk about ATF6 now. So as I mentioned before, ATF6 is one of those main supervisors of the cellular stress response pathway, known as the UPR. 
And it's a protein that acts like a signal. So it signals for other proteins to help relieve the stress. And these other proteins are the helpers that make up the VPR. So how are we going to understand this interaction? So how can we see if HF6 has any role to play in case of infection? So we have to find a way to basically remove ATF6 from the equation and then compare it for when ATF6 is in the equation. And that is why we're going to be using a drug known as Kapin. And Kapin basically kills ATF6 function. So it basically prevents ATF6 from reaching its location and doing its job. Our first experiment or goal was to make sure that our drug works, because it's very important <laughs> if you want to run an accurate experiment. Um, the problem is that there is no known effective way to visualize ATF6 or to see or quantify it. So we are going to look at one of those helpers that I mentioned earlier. So ATF6 signals for the helper known as BIT, which is a protein that helps alleviate cell stress. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to compare um, cells that have been treated with capin with cells that have been treated with thapsigargin, and also known as TG. So thapsigargin is basically the opposite of capin. Capin prevents ATF6, and TG induces ER stress, which means we're going to have more ATF6, which means we're going to have more BIP. So that is our first question. So as I mentioned, TG, if that is our um, is inducing um, ER stress, you're going to have more BIP. We have K-PIN. K-PIN is that lock that prevents ATF6, so less BIP. And even though you're going to have stress, you're still going to have that lock in place, so you're not supposed to see as much BIP. But how are we going to see this BIP, this protein? We performed a Western blot. And Western blots are basically a way to detect proteins and visualize them. So we're going to first start off with a gel. And in this gel, kind of also like gel electrophoresis for DNA, mm -hmm. um, proteins, they travel based on their size. So smaller proteins travel f um, farther, and um, larger proteins stay at the top. And then we're going to transfer the gel to a solid media known as a membrane, where the proteins attach to the membrane. And this membrane is going to be stained with antibodies. And these antibodies are basically molecules that detect and attach to specific proteins. And these antibodies contain also at the top an enzyme that when you add a substrate, it basically emits light. And you can think of it as the more proteins you have, the more antibodies you have attaching to those proteins, the more light that's being emitted. And when you visualize it, you're going to see different bands and you're going to see different intensities of the bands. So the darker the band, the more the protein. So you have more of those antibodies like, attaching to a bunch of proteins. And these were all results. So I'm just going to go over the legend, and the legend basically says, well, we had four treatments for the cells for this experiment. Untreated, so these cells had no drug, and then TG, and then KFN, and then KFN with TG. So the untreated basically serves as a control for like our samples in general, and then actin is a protein that's always in the cell. So Basically, it serves as a control for our experimental procedure. It tells us that we did the experiment right, if they're all about the same size, which they are. <laughs> and as you can see here, this band is darker than these two bands. This basically shows how thapsigargin is working. So you see that the, dark, the band is darker, which means there's more bit, which means that there was more cell stress. But then when you have KFN, it's preventing bit, it's preventing ATF6 from going up, so it's preventing bit from going up even though you're having cell stress. So it shows that the drug is working. So we looked at these um, in the latent cycle, so there was no like, active viral replication. And our next goal was to look at the lytic cycle and see if we combine doxycycline and capin, what will happen. These results, we actually got them two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> But it's actually really, really cool results, so I'm glad I got to put them up. Um, so first, uh, we did test BIP and actin for these results as well, but we also included these two lovely proteins, known as OR45 and KDZIP, and those are viral proteins that are expressed in the lytic cycle of KSHV. Now, let's focus our attention to these ones first. So as you can see, there is not much change between the amount of proteins with no KFN treatment and the amount of proteins with KFN treatment. And this basically shows that 
there was no real change in viral reactivation when you inhibit ATF6 or not, which is interesting. Um, now a little bit about this one, which is like a little side project that's not my project. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned before, um, when you have KIP and it's supposed to not go up because BIP is one of those targets of ATF6, and if KIP is preventing ATF6 from doing its job, you're not supposed to have an upregulation of it, but you do, which is really interesting. Um, this could mean that there is an alternate source that's upregulating BIP even when KIP is present. Overall, what we have found out um, in cells that contain lytically active KSHV and were treated with KFIN, viral protein production remained the same, indicating that inhibiting ATF6 does not prevent viral production, which is still interesting because the results have shown, well, there's, yeah, there's, as I said, there's much more to do still, <laughs> and that's what leads me to my future directions. So we want to study as well um, the viral DNA and also um, viral production. What about baby viruses? <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to thank um, Guillermo, my mentor, for all the help and support this summer, um, and Dr. Arias for the opportunity to be in her lab. It's been a wonderful experience. I've loved every second. Um, and I, I love what I'm doing. And thank you to the Mark Scholarship and CISA. All of you guys are amazing. <laughs> um, and I, really, I like to leave you guys with one of my favorite quotes. The single biggest threat to man's continued dominance in the planet is the virus. Thank you. <laughs>